It's been 15 months since the U.S. started shutting down because of the coronavirus. And today, the big discussion around the pandemic was not about vaccines or masks or the fact that the U.S. just crossed 600,000 deaths. No, people are wondering whether or not the virus leaked from a lab, specifically the Wuhan Institute for Virology. Just a year ago, this was being dismissed as a conspiracy theory, especially by the media. So why this renewed, more serious focus on the quote-unquote lab leak theory? There seem to be a few reasons. There's the Wall Street Journal report from early last week that three researchers in Wuhan's Institute for Virology sought hospital care after getting sick with COVID-like symptoms shortly before the outbreak was confirmed. Just days later, President Joe Biden asked intelligence agencies to redouble, to redouble their efforts to figure out COVID's origins. Facebook stopped taking down posts claiming COVID-19 is man-made or manufactured. And the Washington Post corrected a year-old article about GOP Senator Tom Cotton, an early proponent of the lab leak theory, removing references to the theory as a debunked conspiracy. To be clear, the evidence of a lab leak right now is still only circumstantial. There's no smoking gun or crystal clear new revelation. But at the same time, there also isn't any irrefutable proof that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, that it's jumped from an animal to humans, a theory the World Health Organization says is still the most likely. Scientists and public health experts are still basically unsure about COVID's origins. A point former CDC director under Trump, Robert Redfield, acknowledged in March in an interview with CNN. I am of the point of view that I still think the most likely uh, etiology of this pathogen in Wuhan was a, from a laboratory, um, you know, escaped. Uh, the other people don't believe that. That's fine. Science will eventually figure it out. It's not unusual for respiratory pathogens that are being worked on in a laboratory to infect the laboratory worker. But there is broad consensus on the need for a thorough investigation, especially with accusations that China is not being transparent with its data. In a moment, we're going to break down what the science is telling us or what it can tell us about COVID's origins with two experts in the field. But first, there is something that needs to be definitively shot down. The theory that COVID was created as a biological weapon by the Chinese government. There is zero credible evidence for that claim, despite it making its way around mostly right-wing circles. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton was blamed for promoting that theory. To be fair, he did not explicitly refer to it being a biological weapon. Here's what he did say in January 2020. We still don't know where it originated. Could have been another seafood market. Could have been a farm. Could have been a food processing company. I would note that China, or that Wuhan also has China's only biosafety level four super laboratory that works with the world's most deadly pathogens to include, yes, coronavirus. He's presumably referring there to Wuhan's Institute for Virology and whether it was public misinterpretation or not, his words seem to plant the seed of the bioweapon conspiracy. Some Trump advisors and allies took it to the next step. Trade advisor Peter Navarro wildly claimed that COVID most likely spawned in a bioweapons lab and China, quote, sent nationals, its nationals around the world to seed the virus. Steve Bannon reportedly backed a study claiming the virus was man-made and its lead author once told Fox News it was intentionally released by the Chinese. Again, while scientists are willing to investigate the lab leak theory, literally no serious person or expert thinks COVID was created as a bioweapon. And there is no credible evidence whatsoever for that claim. Today, Dr. Anthony Fauci shot it down too. I think is quite far-fetched that the Chinese deliberately engineered something so that they could kill themselves as well as other people. Uh, I, I think that's a bit far out, John. And when it comes to early dismissal of the lab leak theory, it doesn't help that some of the wilder theories were pushed by members of a Trump administration that spent four years lying to the public about almost everything, led by a president who was outright racist about the nature of the pandemic. Remember that? So, of course, that would result in a boy who cried wolf skepticism from the rest of us. But look, Trump and co may have wanted to focus on China and labs for racist and for self-serving reasons. But the reality is we should still, the rest of us, want to know the origins of the coronavirus, if only to prevent it all from happening again. 
Joining me now to discuss are Dr. Angela Rasmussen, a virologist at the University of Saskatchewan's Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, and Dr. Alina Chan, a postdoctoral researcher and molecular biologist at MIT and Harvard's Broad Institute, who's long argued for the lab leak theory to be taken more seriously. Thank you both for joining me on the show tonight. Alina, let me start with you. New York Times columnist Brett Stevens argues this week that the early dismissal of the lab leak theory was the result of media groupthink, uh, partisanship enforced by censorship. And he says it's a reminder, quote, that sometimes the most destructive enemies of science can be those who claim to speak in its name. Were the media, was the scientific community as a whole too quick to dismiss this early on as a conspiracy in your view? So I want to be quite clear on this point. This is not a blame game. This is a question of possibly the most important question of our lifetimes. Where did this pandemic come from? And how can we stop it from happening again? The question of did it get censored early, it, that might be true. So I understand why a lot of people were rushing to counter more dangerous speculations about this being a bioweapon, about it uh, coming from racists. I totally understand that. But I do think that the media and some scientists took it too far. So they went too far and they stifled the conversation about a plausible origin scenario of this possibly coming from a lab. And when that happens, we are unprotected. We are left unprotected against a future pandemic because this lab hypothesis has been ruled out prematurely. We need to have a credible and rigorous investigation into this very important question. Angela, I'm assuming you agree on the credible investigation. I'm just wondering what you think of Alina's comments about maybe some scientists took the natural explanation or the, the live animal market explanation too far, and there may have been some censorship. So I do agree absolutely that, that there needs to be a serious and credible investigation of the virus's origins, whatever they may be. But I don't agree that, that scientists uh, censored or the media censored discussions about the possibility of a lab leak uh, hypothesis or about the possibility um, that, that that is what happened. I don't think we dismissed that. I think the, the reality is that that is not what the evidence suggested at the time. In fact, uh, Dr. Fauci, um, some of his emails were revealed uh, through a Freedom of Information request. Um, and it, it showed that Dr. Fauci, as well as some of my colleagues who are also virologists, were discussing the possibility that some of the unique features of SARS coronavirus 2 were uh, not natural. Um, as they continued to do genome analysis, uh, it, it turns out that these do seem to be natural, actually. And as time has gone by, we've only gotten more evidence that that weights uh, this in the favor of a natural origin hypothesis. That doesn't mean that the, the lab leak hypothesis has been ruled out. As I said, we need more investigation. Angela, you mentioned evidence. Just a quick question. Has anything actually changed in terms of, I'm not someone who reads scientific journals, I'm assuming you do. Has anything actually changed in recent weeks? Because we're covering this a lot more. I just put up a bunch of headlines earlier on the show. This has become a big talking point in our politics, in our media, in the scientific community. Has any of the actual evidence changed? Has something new come out in recent days to change the calculation? So the, the evidence uh, for natural origin has really been hiding in plain sight. As we've seen this virus spread through the human population, it has continued to evolve and adapt to the use of humans as hosts. Um, the, the emergence of variants that are more effective at replicating in humans, of variants that are capable of evading some aspects of our immune response, that suggests that this virus was not created or passaged uh, to become a pathogen in humans. That doesn't, of course, rule out the possibility that a bat virus could have accidentally uh, spilled over in the lab um, however, it does suggest that this virus was not tampered with uh, at the beginning. This virus was not being studied. It was not being cloned. There were no new features added to it uh, to make it a better, more effective human pathogen. That all points towards zoonotic origin. In okay. addition to that, we know that, that the virus is capable of infecting a number of different animal species very efficiently. Um, so it is entirely possible that in Wuhan, a city of 11 million people that uh, is, is really receiving um, animals uh, for sale uh, and transport from all over China um, could have certainly had an animal that, that had the progenitor to this virus imported. And in fact, it does appear that the epicenter of early transmission was okay. in a wild animal market. 
Alina, is one of the problems with a lot of our coverage of this early on, and you, you alluded to this, I mentioned it at the start of the show, this idea that if you talk about a lab, especially to the layman, especially to lay people who don't follow science closely, the minute you say lab, people think bioweapon, especially when you have the Chinese government, the geopolitics, the kind of antipathy towards China, especially on the right here in the Trump administration. Did that muddy the water? How do we explain to people clearly there's a difference between kind of live animal market, natural, lab leak, and then bioweapon. Yes, I, I think the solution is more science communication and more accurate journalism, not the opposite. So censoring or dumbing down science too much is, is harmful to, to the public understanding of pandemics and viruses and, and how that ties into solutions, how to track the origins. So I'd like to disagree gently with what uh, Angel Angie uh, raised just now. Where we are at right now is that we've searched for more than a year for an intermediate host uh, for the animal that carried the immediate precursor of the virus before it jumped into humans. We have not found it. The current evidence is all circumstantial and it is consistent with both a natural and a lab origin of this virus. There are precedents for both lab leaks, even of the first SARS virus. It's, it slipped out of lab at least four to six times and, and many times were in China. So this problem of a growing number of labs around the world, creating more pathogens, researching and collecting more pathogens. It's a problem for everybody. It's not just a problem for China. And we need to have a very serious conversation amongst both scientists and non-scientist stakeholders to figure out and communicate to the public how we can rebuild better, how we can make research safer and beneficial at the same time. Angela, in a Washington Post op-ed, Stanford professor David Relman uh, warns that scientists have been too quick to dismiss lab leak theories in general, not just in the case of COVID. And he says, if the lab leak hypothesis in this case is put aside because it's too contentious, laboratory safety and especially risky research will continue to be ignored. What are the stakes here in regards to exploring this possibility about lab leaks and whether it turns out to be, whether or not it turns out to be true in the end? Well, I think what, what is really the most harmful about all of this is it conflates uh, a need for international standards for working with these pathogens in high containment, in BSL-3 containment or above. There are currently no international standards. So that is a problem. It is something that's worthy of future discussion. But if this is used to, to essentially shut down all of virology research, ultimately we're going to be left uh, unprepared for the next pandemic. Now, lab leaks have happened historically, um, including with SARS coronavirus classic. a lab leak was likely, um, I think is, is quite simply untrue. And I think ultimately it can really hurt our efforts to be prepared for the next pandemic. Ironically, the reason that we were able to develop vaccines against SARS coronavirus 2 so quickly is because this type of research was occurring before the pandemic. So... So when you mentioned kind of the different types of research, uh, Alina, you mentioned not dumbing down the science too much. Let me just put this to you. Dr. Fauci has been a target of the right throughout the pandemic, especially coming under fire from Senator Rand Paul, who's hammered him over what's known as gain of function research. Have a listen to Rand Paul on Fox News today. Dr. Fauci still denies it to this day, but in his private emails, he puts in the subject line, urgent we must discuss this gain of function research so he knows it's gain of function and he needs to be pinned down on this there are scientists across america who will dispute what he's saying who says that specifically the grant and the money given to wuhan that dr fauci approved that it was gain of function research and we need to talk to these scientists in this field and hear from them about how dr fauci is not being honest with the american public hey, you know, Alina, can you explain in layperson's terms what gain of function is and isn't and how it might be related to the pandemic and all these, all these battling theories? A lot of people know that I'm quite moderate in my viewpoints. So this gain of function topic, it's very controversial and there's a lot of gray area. It's difficult for scientists to definitively say what research is gain of function versus what isn't gain of function. Uh, we are all, I think, <laughs> in for 
a rude awakening about what types of pathogen research are risky. But I'd like to emphasize what Angie said. This type of research, virology, is extremely valuable. This is how we find like treatments for outbreaks. This is how we develop vaccines. It shouldn't be completely banned. But what we really need now is a transparent uh, forum where scientists and also non-scientists get together internationally to say, how can we make this work safer? And some of that might be as easy as relocating yeah. some of the centers of research to less highly densely populated areas in the world. Yes, good point. Last question on a slightly different topic. Angela, let me ask you this. Today, the Biden administration announced it's shipping out its first wave of COVID vaccine doses abroad. 25 million doses out of what they say are 80 million uh, on offer. You know, 60 million are from AstraZeneca out of that 80 million. Officials say those won't be released until they're approved by U.S. regulators. Why is this all taking so long? White House COVID advisor Andy Slavitt first announced those would be sent out in April. I just don't get, you know, people are dying in their tens of thousands of India. Do you know why it's taking so long for us to send our stockpile to people who need it? You know, Mehdi, I wish that I knew. Um, this has been one of the, the most continually frustrating things for me to observe throughout this entire pandemic. But I actually think that um, this is really a common theme that goes back to the original topic of this interview. The nationalization of pandemic preparedness and pandemic responses has been incredibly harmful to make sure that everybody gets a vaccine who needs one, which in a pandemic is everybody in the world, um, to make sure that we can figure out where this virus actually came from. If we want to investigate any type of origin theory, we need to uh, collaborate globally, including with the Chinese government and Chinese scientists, including with other countries around the world, including with the World Health Organization. We will be less prepared for the next pandemic if we do not strengthen and shore up our global collaborations. Very good points. Dr. Alina Chan and Dr. Angela Rasmussen, thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you for enlightening us on this very complicated and controversial issue. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.